wildcard. Canterbury United, women's premiership champions. I imagine by what you said before that the men's premiership takes a little break now. Women's premiership is finished. So how does the how we start with the Canterbury United wrapping their championship run up, and then we'll flow into just the domestic landscape, and then we'll we'll hit the international scene. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty fascinating final in the end. Um, it's it was one of those ones where like. Well, uh, well. First of all, if um, if things had gone differently and there hadn't been a another one of them bloody stupid little uh, ineligibility situations, um, which New Zealand football seem to specialize in so much, makes you wonder what whether like sitting back and throwing out punishments after the fact is really as effective as maybe stepping up beforehand and giving better um giving better help to the to the franchises and the different teams and clubs and whatever so that these things don't happen in the first place. Maybe that would be better if there were better structures and whatever. But um, Auckland had an ineligible player for just the dumbest reason um, and then didn't get punished, but then did get punished because they were like, we can't, we can't, um, we can't apply a ban because no one actually put in a complaint about an ineligible player in any of these games. And so all three of the teams that the, the player had played against then appealed it's like, well, we can't ban them because no one complained, but you're allowed to appeal the fact that you didn't complain, which doesn't just... I don't know how these things work. I don't know who sits there in an office deciding that these are the rules that are allowed to... Um, whatever. What what happened is Auckland got... Just before the final week of the round robin, Auckland got docked nine points, and those nine points went to the three teams that they played, whatever. and um, it meant that instead of an Auckland Canterbury final and Auckland had beaten Canterbury 4-1 earlier on at the start of the season um, and in Canterbury too. So that would have been just a fascinating contest there. Uh, instead of that, we got Canterbury against Capital who got um, nudged up into second place, who they had beaten 4-0 um, in Wellington like the second to last week, which was Capital's last game because they had to buy the next week. So they, they lost 4-0 to, to Canterbury went on their bye thinking that's the end of their season, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh no, wait, hold on, we might actually make the final. Then they did make the final because Canterbury beat Northern in their, in their last round, which was effectively like a semi-final game, um, taking Northern out, who had also been a very handy team throughout. Um, and then, yeah, <laughs> got to go play Canterbury again, and then they lost 4-0 again, which is a bit of a mirror image, but it wasn't. that's not necessarily like a good... Uh, accurate showing of what happened because it was um, it was quite a quite a it was quite a feisty game for one. There were a lot of um, a few injuries, especially in the first half throughout, and there were um, you know, some heavy challenges. And Canterbury definitely did look like the the stronger team, but for a long time there, they were really having trouble finding a way through. And and Georgia Candy, who ended up winning the the league MVP um, in goal for Capital, had just an absolute blinder. She's been incredible all season. She was actually the um, the backup goalkeeper at the under seventeens two years ago, behind an elite who was arguably the best player in that um, under seventeen squad. So Georgia Candy was kind of like flying under the radar there. Um, she had a just a brilliant season for for Capital, and I've I I think she probably would have had like uh, in fact i think assume that's probably what this is i doubt the mvp thing had any factor in the final because they didn't count the golden boot as being part of the final that was a round robin thing and so georgia candy won the mvp based on her performances in the um and the in the round robin and then played even better in the final she saved two penalties in the first half um <laughs> incredible stuff but then yeah in the second half canterbury just like um they stepped it up again. They brought on Annalie Longo off the bench, and if you can chuck in a player who's just clearly a step above everybody else in this competition, it makes a big difference. Although I don't think she'd actually touch the ball. Um, they they scored just after she came on, but she hadn't touched the ball. It was about like ten seconds after that sub was made. Um, it was Amelia Abbott who played a brilliant through ball to um, it was Gabby Rennie, who also Abbott and Rennie also part of that under 17s team um, at that World Cup that came third a couple years ago. And yeah, just take the goalkeeper out of it with a nice one on one, slide it through when no one's going to save it. And then from there on, it was Canterbury just sort of ran away with it once they finally got the breakthrough. Ended up winning 4 0. Gabby Rennie got two goals. Uh, I think uh, I think Brittany Lee Nicholson got one, I I think. And then um, Nikola Dominikovic got one right at the end. Um, don't have my notes in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. So uh, the third chance for Canterbury, I think that's the eighth final in a row. And 
think it's I think it's five championships all up in that stretch. I'm not sure, but um, one of the one of the other undercover like major dynasties of recent New Zealand sport really is this Canterbury women's football team. Just like year after year, and even like you know they had that loss to Auckland in the second week where they didn't just get beaten; they got like, they were four 0 down at um, after about half an hour or something in that game. Like they got just like. Uh, mobbed from the start by a very good Auckland team and it felt like maybe they had had like they'd had they had some troubles defensively just with their shape at the start and and working through things and they weren't necessarily scoring the goals that repre- like that reflected how they'd been playing and then they just sort of it took three or four weeks but they eventually clicked and um I think it was a six nil win over Central where it where it felt like it had clicked at that point and then they didn't concede another goal in their last four games um, scored about 16, I think it was, in that streak, including back-to-back 4-0 wins over, um, well, they played a game in between over against Northern, um, but it was back-to-back for, for Capital as far as from their perspective. Um, yeah, just the best team over the course of the season, just a once again, like, rising above, peaking at the right time, just another one of them very, very impressive um, performances from the Canterbury United Pride, and it's, it's interesting to just look at, like, this team is nothing like the team that started that little dynasty. Even just like between this year and last year, there's I think there are only six players who started both finals. Like, it's it's not just a case of you fig- you like stumble upon the best team and then you can you like proceed to win championship after championship. Like this team's been replenished the whole way through. They continually find new players, bringing new um new girls into the squad, and then just continue to win on top of that. So it's one of them. One of them teams that maybe just because of the profile of the women's premiership, people don't have the the same like um, understanding of just what a level they're at. But like three three championships in a row is a big deal. That's uh that's pretty impressive, eh? Like there's not too many other sporting leagues where you get that unless it's like a a Wellington Saints or something where they're just clearly better and they have the best players every year and therefore. Um, are able to build the best systems and whatever and hire the best coaches and they win because they're the best, sure. But it's not quite the same thing with, with uh, this Canterbury women's team where it's like they do actually have to bring quite a few new players into the fold each year and continually maintain that same level. It's it's pretty amazing. It is indeed. Is that... I was actually... I was, I was thinking about this when I was watching the game because obviously being a, a hockey joker... Canterbury is very good at hockey, as a lot of the regions are. Um, but I was thinking, like, just in a... We don't have to explore this to much extent. I just want to chuck it out there. Like, Canterbury has a good women's football setup, which you've basically told me that that's the, that's the women's footballing powerhouse at the moment. And based on what I know about hockey... And based on what I know about where these sports we've got basketball as well, like I'm, I'm fairly confident that netball is going to suffer some sort of impact because of just how, how many sports are available to to like young young women and girls, and that was hammered home again in that game in that Premiership final because I was watching that Canterbury team, and I was like, all these woman all these girls are re- pretty good at football fairly athletic and i reckon 10 years ago 15 years ago obviously more they would have been playing netball and i i think that is that is something to take take away from the women's sport growth in new zealand as well is that there's different pockets of powerhouse i know like hockey has a very like a little pocket in um napier in this in the Hawke's Bay region is very good at producing hockey players. And like if you're a girl growing up in the Hawke's Bay region, the facilities and the resources available to you there, you're gonna grow up like if you want to play hockey, you're gonna be good at hockey. And the same is for Canterbury. Like Canterbury has produced a lot of male and female black sticks and continues to produce black sticks at a high rate as well. So that's just something beneath the radar to keep an eye on just when you're thinking about the women's premiership and and the state of women's sport in Aotearoa as far as like who 
who are some of your favorite players to watch? Not necessarily best players, but just your picks of fun players and, and names to keep an eye on from the women's premiership that you, you noticed. Um, obviously, there's some players who are going to, who we have talked about picking up gigs over in Australia. So maybe it's a situational thing with them or is it just like or maybe just some some fun players that really stood out for you you mentioned a couple from the final but in wrapping up the whole women's premiership do you have a couple standouts that spring to mind yeah it's it's quite a few i could um well i will actually write a team of the season i think if i can find the time over the next few days i would like to so i think i'll probably do that um and there's like I'd already jotted down a bunch of names who I thought would be in contention there. There's like there's quite a few. I mean the 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 thing um about just writing about domestic sports in general, particularly with football, is um but like the the niche cash has had many examples with other you know I I I know for sure like it's when you write about a cricket player coming through and then like two years later they're playing for the Black Caps or they're just working their way and then other people start to hear about them and you can sit back and say like, well, I knew about this guy beforehand. And like I have, that that's one of the most fun things about following the football scene is you, you can't really go much below national level because it's too regionalized and you don't have the same access to it and stuff. But um, I like to try get like, it's, it's, it feels like an investment um, getting to know some of the players as they come through, especially guys who are coming out of like Wellington Phoenix and LA Academy, just because those seem to be the best, the best um, caliber of players, um, young players anyway. Like it's just, it feels like an investment to, to get some kind of understanding about these kind of guys and to, to, um, to write about them in a way where it's like certain players, you just get a feeling like, and this is a test as well of how well I can read a game and how well I can scout footballers and whatever. But sometimes it just feels like this person is going on to bigger and better things. And it's fun to get in there ahead of time. So you actually can offer some real perspective when, um, so for example, some of these players, like when, if Georgia candy gets called up to the football ferns at some point, I can write about that squad naming and with some kind of like perspective that I have, deeper than just what it says in the press release or what I might be able to find out on Wikipedia or soccer way or those kind of things, you know? Um, so that's kind of the angle, which most excites me when I'm watching football. And so looking at this women's premiership, um, it is like young Kiwi players who feel like they have the potential to play professionally. Um, and that's that sort of stand out in that way. And there's, I mean, there's, it, there's a really simple list, which is that under-17s World Cup squad. There's also the FFDP squad, the F- Future Ferns Development Program, which is a bit of an interesting one because you don't actually see, I think there's only about three players from this Canterbury team that are in that because a lot of them, because, I mean, the program's based in Auckland, so I think some players probably decline the possibility because they're like, I can't move permanently to Auckland. I don't want to do that. Um, some players do, and then they end up playing for, like, uh, I think Northern had the most of them. Um, and that's actually quite an interesting, like just in light of what you're saying about pockets of hockey strength and, and different sports. So I think that's kind of an interesting one in the female football scene where that's actually like an option where you have like, obviously Auckland probably has the overall strongest, um, group of players, but you like Auckland split into Auckland and Northern, um, next year, it'll be split into four different club teams with the way the premiership's being shaken up. Um, and so you have like a hub there, which has probably always been the case, but then the two strongest academies are based out of, um, uh, sort of Pororua region, really. They're both, um, Wellingtonians and the Phoenix Academy and the Ole Academy. So you've got this, like, this little, like, dual hub there. And then if this isn't the case in the men's side, I don't think you see a big strength of, um, talent necessarily, um, in the South Island, which is maybe just lagging behind those other two, um, you know, the the Northern uh, Leagues and the Central Leagues. I don't think the, the two South Island Leagues are necessarily in the same caliber. A couple of very good clubs out of there, but not the overall production of players. And if you look at the All Whites, I think very overwhelmingly North Islanders um, in those groups, even now where you're getting, well, even probably especially now, um, where you're getting like a lot of those Ole and Phoenix guys are at the age now 
where they're playing internationally but um the um on the female side of things i don't think that's the case like you still got a lot of very very good canterbury players because canterbury have this hub of excellent um footballers and you've got a couple you know, there's a couple from that under 17s group um that played for southern as well so there's there's more of a spread around the country and you do have like at least three very clear local and they're the three biggest cities in the in the nation so that's a beautiful thing as well probably a good re- like really healthy thing as well for the game because it means that the sport is more accessible at the top level like not just the participation level but like rep teams and pathways to the top and all that seems to work a little bit better in the on the like with the women's um footy stuff as to some players who who are like pushing through that like georgia candy for sure um some of the some of the girls you mentioned going to the w league who haven't been at that level before like um lily olfeld and uh liz anton and uh, malia steinmetz all you know excellent seasons um there's oh, I'll, I'll tell you i mean i could go through quite a few like gabby rennie as well had a very good year and um michaela robertson at at um at capital charlotte wilford carroll there as well like um chloe knott um uh daisy cleverly had a really good year coming back from college in the state she's played quite a few times for the for the um football fern so macy fraser and even like at central with like finishing bottom of the table um that you, you you wouldn't necessarily think you'd get be getting the standout players but one of their big problems was just that there was such a young team they had like a bunch of 16 17 year olds they're trying to build for it's a better team in a couple of years and um, we'll see what that actually looks like in a couple of years because the because of the way the 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 league is is um being changed but like Aniela Jensen there Yana Niedermeyer both very good like there's there's names all the way through Kelly Brown Grace Wisniewski at um Wybop and one player who probably Im- impressed as much as anyone was um Michaela Foster at uh at Wybop who the other game they they drew four all against Auckland they were four nil down with 10 minutes to go it's the last game of the season um, Michaela Foster sort of started as like a um as a left back was too good to play left back and then started playing um in the in midfield a bit uh, mix it up between the two she very good cross on her left foot um took a scored directly from a corner to help get Weibot back into that game then she took a corner from the right hand side and almost scored there as well but someone else headed it in um on the goal line basically that was swing. The one scores a goal with their right foot from a corner, takes a corner from score, scores a goal with their left foot from a corner, takes a corner from the other side with their right foot, almost scores with that one. They ended up drawing four rolls. It was an incredible game of football. Um, Michaela Foster. Fun fact about her is she is the daughter of Ian Foster, the All Blacks coach. So there you go. That's another trend that's happening. Like most of these famous um, rugby names, their children aren't playing rugby, which is uh pretty interesting um yeah it'd be interesting to look up some of them eh? like just yeah. how yeah definitely like, there's no shortage like um obviously covering rugby league there's a lot of father son like kiwi father son and rugby father son but it is you are like it is something that is it is popping up like you're seeing a lot of um famous sporting names appear in other sports in new zealand that just again shows that we're dealing with the generation that can grow up and play any sport they want to play and it's all good there's no um there's no like cultural ramifications or anything like that and you're talking about the south island as well to me the south island is where the netball rugby culture is rooted like that's where that's where you're getting the heartiest new zealand rugby netball vibes so i do believe that will be the as we've already seen with Canterbury United, that's the area of the most growth and expansion in other sports. Like, I, I'm sure there's some basketball funk out of the South Island. I can't pinpoint it off the top of my head, but if I did a deep dive, I'd find it. So, let alone the other sports. Let's. Well, one more question on the women's stuff. Who, which player from this Premiership? will play for the white ferns first like who's your pick for the next white fern from the not white fern football fern from this women's premiership who hasn't obviously played football ferns footy before 
and not just the uh, squad selection. I'm talking about playing football ferns. Yeah, um, that's tricky to to predict because the football ferns have such a stabilized squad, and there aren't a lot of them who uh, would be expected to retire between now and the next World Cup. And so you often hear that, like uh, almost every game I watched, the there'd be someone, and certainly every game that got covered on Sky, which was only two of them, um, and one of them was like a late addition, but still, like there there was always the point mentioned many times about, um, well, there's a there's a World Cup coming up in, you know, in four years on New Zealand surf, and uh, a lot of these players will be wanting to put themselves in position for that, and I was like, yes, they, they will, obviously, and uh, there will be a few spots open, but not a lot, like most of the players that are there are pretty established, there's not a lot of space there, um, and a f- there were there were quite a few. Oh, what about five years? What about ten years? Like, well, I mean, I, there there's will no be time some. frame. I'm just I just want to know who's who's your pick. Yeah, there will be some who get in before that, obviously, and there will be some spots, and then there will also be players who like upend some of the ones who are currently established. And I think the role where that's most uh, open is the obvious one of striker. Where um, so since the last World Cup, for example. Uh, who were the strikers they had there? Um, Hannah Wilkinson, who was coming back from injury. Uh, Sarah Gregorius has retired. Emma Kete has retired, was actually playing for Northern in this um, premiership season. And uh, Rosie White, who doesn't really play striker for her club team. She's more of an attacking midfielder. So that's, you know, obviously injuries could happen. Breakout players could happen. Who knows? But um the striker is, is the spot that feels like the one that I should focus on because that's the spot that the team most needs someone who can like offer some game breaking abilities. Um, as to who that might be, um, <laughs> that's that's a good bloody question. Uh, Gabby Rennie would be one who's um, got like great pace and and um, very like attack minded striker for for Canterbury. There's got the double in the final. Um, I think Kelly Brown would be an interesting one from from Wybop. Uh, someone who can score from long range, is, you know, scores a lot of amazing goals as well as she has scored a, the best of the goals that New Zealand scored in that under seventeen run was her. I forget who they were playing against, but she honed one in from about thirty meters out. Um, oh, who else would be? These probably all under seventeens from that same squad as well. But um, like Arabella Maynard at Northern would be another in contention. Um, t- yeah, they name sort of players on that on that um kind of like, there's a few more I could go through, but I don't know necessarily that any of them would be like anytime soon New Zealand full international representatives. I think more you're looking at like those pathways through the youth teams and um I think they cancelled the last under twenty World Cup um women's one, I'm pretty sure, because it was meant to be uh I think this I think I I think next year, I think it was meant to be 2021, but I can't remember. Um, It might have been late 2020. They cancelled it for obvious reasons, which is kind of a bummer because a lot of those under-17s would have been flowing through into that. So I don't know if they've they've, um, rescheduled it in a year time and if the eligibility thing will be different, it'll make it an under-21s or something instead or what. But um, I think that'd be your best indication is like the players who can work up through those pathways. I don't know. But um, what I like about how this conversation goes these days is that it's no longer about like who stands out at the premiership and therefore goes straight into the football phones and then therefore plays at world cups and therefore is auditioning for a professional contract like we're at a level now where you can get professional contracts out of the premiership or out of especially out of um like way more especially out of new zealand youth grades and then because there's a lot of good football phones you play professionally and work your way in from a professional environment which is how it should be going um that's what we want like that's the that's the situation that New Zealand football should be pushing towards is getting players professionally before they make the football ferns so that when they make the ferns, they're just in a much like competing for places in a much stronger, um, healthier, vibrant um, sort of just situation as opposed to like you, the, the situation that has been the case in the past where we haven't had many professionals, um, even just as recently as five to 10 years ago, where you can make the, national team as an amateur and you're not playing full-time and you're not training full-time and it's just not quite the same like the standard will rise a lot sharper when that things are working the other way around which is mostly what we're starting to see now which is a good thing yeah and generally speaking that's a interesting kind of new zealand sport development process as you 
set up the pipelines within New Zealand and everything is like at, at a premium or at the best it can be in New Zealand to build the players up, then you let them go and get into professional setups around the world because that's kind of what New Zealand can't offer in a lot of sports is the strictly professional sporting environment. And then you you utilize the professional sports environments of other countries to prepare the players for international sport. I think that model can be applied to a lot of different sports in New Zealand as well. Because it's not about New Zealand. Like, it's very, as we've discussed many times, it's very easy for a player in any sport to get too good to be playing in New Zealand. Like, there's a certain level of football, hockey, rugby league whatever it is, where you graduate from a New Zealand level to a professional level, and all the better professional systems for most of these sports are around the world, you let them develop in the professional setup and use that as a pipeline to then prepare your players for international sport. Um, Just another interesting idea there. Right, let's fly around the world. What... Give us your pick. I'm not sure what the international leagues are doing in the football realm, but you can still take your pick. What are, what are some key footballers that... Um, well, as, as this is the, the final podcast of the year, and it is apparently a congested time of the year for the many football leagues around the world, some of them do stop though, right? Like some stop, some keep going. Yeah, most of them. Most of them what? Stop or keep going? Like the some some years go by, like calendar years, the seasons, because they don't want to play through the heat of like the heat, the the opposite of the heat. They don't want to play through the the freezing aspects of winter. So the Scandinavian leagues like that um, do the same like year to year thing like America does. So just so happens America and Scandinavia are two places where a lot of Kiwi footballers play. So those leagues are all currently not in action. A lot of the other ones. Also take winter breaks, which are coming up basically now, um, till a, a week or two into into January. Although there's not as much of that this year because everything's crammed in because they're often started late because of the because of the COVIDs. Um, England is the one country that really ramps things up at this time, um, and even then there's some sketchiness. Like, for example, Bria Percival was meant to be playing against Chelsea. Uh, this weekend in their last game of the year but what happened is that Chelsea had a couple positive corona tests and therefore that game got postponed so um, that's kind of what everyone's dealing with England's trying to play more football than ever at the moment at a time when the virus is more out of control than ever so um, trickiness abounds with with all that really right so give me two or three players who are going to be busy over the next few months next few weeks and why people should tap into what they're up to. Well, the major one's going to have to be there for Chris Wood, playing for Burnley, doing what he does. He'd been on a little bit of a downturn where he just the team hadn't been playing that well. They'd been struggling to try to get points. It dipped into the relegation zone. Uh, he'd missed a couple of big chances, just like games where he'd get one good chance in a game and he didn't score it, and then it feels like, oh, well, you, you drew nil or you lost 1-0. Uh, that big chance your striker had was the big chance he needed to score. And so he was getting a bit of pressure on him for that reason in ways that wasn't really fair because it's not like he was missing open goals. Uh, but he did get back on the score sheet this morning, which is lovely. I think it's his third of the season um, in a win over Wolverhampton. So that actually lifts them out of the drop zone as of Christmas, which is a nice little milestone for them. They have um, beat Arsenal not so long ago and good win here against Wolves. So a couple of relative well, are in a state at the moment but Wolves have been a decent team they um got a result over Liverpool not that long ago from what I from what I remember um no it was Chelsea it was Chelsea they scored against them right in the right at the death uh which they threatened to do against Burnley but didn't um so he's going to be getting a lot of games and hopefully with Burnley seemingly getting on a little bit of a nice run of form um that it will hopefully lead to a whole lot of goals for him because he, he needs them he talked up getting a 20 goal season at the start of the um, campaign and he's currently at three so uh, a few more wouldn't wouldn't go astray uh, as to who else to follow I, it's, 
it's not a lot. It's in the next couple of weeks, even the women's stuff in England will be on a bit of a break. Um, someone like Tommy Smith will still be playing for Colchester. They've lost their last two games, but they were on a good run before that, pushing up towards the, the League 2 um, playoff spots. And don't, you know, I'm not, most, most leagues will take a week or so off, so there's not, it's actually not a lot else going on. We'll, we'll see. Um, one thing that will be very interesting, though, to, to focus on is uh, we could see a bit of signing season stuff, particularly in America. I know there's a couple of drafts coming up later on. I've been trying to find out what kind of players might be eligible, if there are any New Zealanders with a possibility even of, of getting drafted into the, the men's or women's leagues in the States. Uh, expansion, I think, believe for both. There's certainly an expansion team in the women's thing, and there has been expansion teams in recent years uh, in the men's stuff. So this should be openings at least like but it's just a matter of i don't know i don't know who's who's out there and available and um it's a bit weird because there wasn't actually a really a college football season or college soccer season last year so it might be a little bit out of the blue who decides to declare and who's available uh, hopefully there's a couple to be able to follow but I, i'm not necessarily betting on it but um for example in the last week even uh like before that all the mls stuff their seasons finishes they they you know sign or resign or release the players that are on the end of their contracts etc dealt with a bit of that last week now this week uh for example rosie white has signed her her offered contract extension with um the ol reign so she's coming back uh max mata just signed with a usl team which is the level below mls um which is bloody awesome because it's about time we had another striker there. It's just been all defensive players recent recent times there. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I wonder if there might not be a few more where that comes from. Like those those American teams, their season ends, they deal with the immediate things of the squads they currently have. And around this time they start, like, because preseason will be uh, mid-January, February, around that time, they start thinking towards next year and looking at like where are the gaps in our team where like what kind of players might we sign hoping for a couple more where they came from and it might even be the same case in in Scandinavia like I'm just I'm hoping for a few nice Christmas presents in terms of the transfer stuff and it's also coming into the January um, European transfer window which I don't expect there to be really any Kiwi involvement there but there might be a few um, names going over on development deals or whatever that's the kind of thing probably to to keep an ear to the ground about and over the next two weeks is not so much who's actually playing and who's um actually like doing the football thing but who might be stepping up to that level like who might be getting opportunities and where um players that might be getting released players that might be getting transferred players that especially might be getting signed that's something i'm hoping to have you know hoping to be able to bulk up some of these flying kiwis with over the next two weeks is is having some of them good transfer signing news. Do you have anyone who is on the rise that you might predict could be a standout transfer movement or promotion? Like who is someone that you in, at your in Well, your, you never really know. But as someone in your Flying Kiwis pocket, who would you be eyeing up as a as someone to pounce on? Yeah, it's just, it's hard to predict because players come, like, players have their own timelines of whatever and... But who do you want? Who do you want? Um, let me think about that. I mean, there's a few players who I would like to see get in A-League opportunities, whether that's with the Phoenix or elsewhere, but those squads are mostly all sorted at the moment. Um, but... Uh, I mean, I like I just ran through a few names from the women's stuff before, so all those names and more. Um, as to the men's side of things, uh, we're at a time when like I I don't know what Alex Grieve is doing if he's going to go back to the states, um, finish off his college stuff. He's a player who, um, when he does finish that, um, with what well, I don't even know. Because it's I can't find any good information on stuff because of the lack of a 2020 season, so I don't know where he's at. Um, if he wants to go back to college again or whatever, um, Jesse Randall's just going over to college as well. He's scored four goals, including a couple beauties on the weekend for for Hawks Bay. He's a player who, um, I mean, he'll be playing college for a year or two now at least. Uh, he's a guy who has potential to be playing professionally down the line. I think Alex Grieve's someone near the end of his college 
I think he's playing extremely well for Waitakere. Um, this premiership season, he's a player who I would hope would be in the mix for, for getting drafted or for finding his way onto a USL team. Um, when he's done with that, I have no idea what he's what his plans are or what he's up to. There's a few other players in that kind of mold because he sort of gets to, like, I could say Hamish Watson's been having a really good season, but he's not going to sign professionally. He's kind of, um, I don't know how old he is, 26 or something like that probably around that range like he's probably done his little bit um don't think he's going to get another opportunity at that level necessarily maybe but and you know hold out hope but it's not the kind of guy that scouts are going to be out there looking for so you sort of are looking at a certain age of player and um most of those guys in the premiership at the moment are just coming through so it's tricky to say there's quite a few obviously wellington phoenix players who would have um things i'd have to check my bloody i do have my list open so um let's go through some uh don't know don't know about it uh maybe a logan rogerson or something like that it, it from auckland city might be able to use this as a launching pad the way that maya bevan did um uh who wouldn't bet on anyone in canterbury necessarily since suburbs have a few like sean bright would be a player who i for sure sean bright can play professionally it's just a matter of like what his when he want when he would consider it. maybe even someone like a Calvin Carlaw. Um I mentioned Jesse Randall there. Uh, where are we with Hamilton? Maybe uh, Adam Davidson or someone like that. Um, Harris and Messenger have played professionally. Have come back. Tommy Semi is a guy. He's not a New Zealander, but um, he's I, he had a trial with the Phoenix briefly. I just would i i would have thought this year would i was i was like semi not expecting it but semi holding out hope maybe that um that an a-league team might just because especially someone like the phoenix who they're obviously not going to use all their import spots maybe by this is the one year you're going to get to take on like a project player import maybe tommy semi could have been that kind of guy um but I'm perfectly happy watching him dominate for hamilton wanderers in the meantime uh ben matter at 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 um at Team Wellington would be a good shout. Uh, defender with a lot of size. One guy kick's come, been great for them as well. As a, he's twenty playing midfield. Um, ben Mata, brother of Max Mata, who mentioned before. With Zachary, I mentioned Grieve, uh, Dane Schnell, Andrew Crom would also be players with like uh, potential, like going on to bigger and better things. And then a whole heap of the Weenix. Um, ben Old is close. Tom Rainbolt's been in the Vancouver. Whitecaps Academy in the past. Lewis Toomey's having a really good year. Henry Hamilton's about to go over to um, to university in the States. Adam Hillis has been good. Uh, Jalen Rodwell. Alex Paulson's been borderline goalkeeper of the season. He's been incredible. Curtis Mogg is a guy who, who um, has the, the size, the leadership, the the capabilities to play A-League one day. Um, there, yeah, there's, there's quite a few there on who could be on the radar but you just never quite know like where things will go with these it's always just a um i just kind of sit back and and hope for like happy surprises and keep my ear to the ground for little things that you hear like i did know that um from from various like tweets and whisperings that that max Mata was likely to be going to america after he came back from switzerland so you, you hear little things but i i try not to like get involved in the weeds of those things you just let just let the let the joy surprises kind of like catch me off guard it's always fun wake up one day check the twitters and then all of a sudden so and so signed with such and such and it's a lovely thing well you listed off about 30 players there so i think that is well i just, I just went team by team because i couldn't think off the top of my head but that's 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 wraps up that wraps up 2020 it wraps up this episode because it's Shows just how much interesting sporting talent there is in Aotearoa um, with that nice little summary. So good work.